Isang mapagpalang umaga, mga kapatid, mula sa CBCM and sa DJCC Tumana. It's a joy to worship God together with you this morning. Sa ating paninimula ng ating panambahan, tayo po'y mag-umpisa sa ating panalanginan. Let us close our eyes and bow our heads and let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. More so, we thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you through songs of praise that amidst this pandemic, this current situation that we are facing, still you have granted us the opportunity to uh, gather together and have fellowship and have you minister to us by the study of your word. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the means that you are allowing us to continue the ministries that you have entrusted us. And more so as we gather today in prayer, Lord, we continue to lift up to you our ministries. Salamat po, Panginoon, sa mga ministeryong pinagkatiwala niyo po sa amin. And more so, salamat po sa mga opportunities na pinagkakaloob niyo upang magamit kami sa inyong ubasan. Lord, we ask that may you continue to guide us and grant us your vision as we further your ministries. Lord, kayo po ang patuloy na humawak sa lahat ng ministeryong pinagkatiwala niyo po sa amin from the study of your word, from our discipleship classes to our children's ministry and even our youth ministry and how we do our HFGs. Lord, we ask that you continue to take hold and be glorified to the ministries that we have in CBCM and even in our outreach at DJCC Tumana. Panginoon, we pray for the leaders, yung mga tumatayo, Lord, sa mga ministeryong ito. We ask, Lord, that you grant them an extra measure of your grace Panginoon, kayo po ang magbibigay sa kanila ng katalinuhan. Kayo po ang gagabay sa kanila, Lord, as they do the ministries that you have given us. And more so, as they stand, Panginoon, kayo po ang uh, patuloy na maitaas ng bawat isa sa kanila. Lord, be, may the glory not be to us, but may the glory be only to Christ, the one who enables us to do all these things. More so, kami po ay nagpapasalamat, Lord, sa bawat miyembro sa bawat pamilya that are represented by CBCM. Lord, we ask that you continue to take hold of our families. Kayo po ang patuloy na maging Diyos na nagpro-provide ng aming mga pangangailangan. Kayo po ang Panginoon na patuloy na kumalinga sa amin. Amidst the uncertainty of this time, we ask that you continue to take hold of us. Continue to take hold of the fathers as they lead the families. Continue to be with the mothers as well. And may you be with the children as well, especially as they study amidst the difficulties of this time, Panginoon. Kayo po ang patuloy na lumukob at bumalot sa aming mga pamilya. Bind us with your love. Bind us with your grace. And more so, amidst the situations that we are facing, Lord, we ask that you allow us to continue to exalt your name. Panginoon, even in this situation, ang tanging dalangin po namin, is patuloy na maitaas ang inyong pangalan. Whether the pandemic goes and be cured, or whether it tarries, Lord, may your purpose be done here on earth. And may you be glorified and exalted through the lives of every believer, of everyone who claims the name of Christ. May we honor you and glorify you. Panginoon, salamat po dahil you still grant us the opportunity to study and meditate your word. Lord, we ask that you continue to open our hearts, incline our ears towards understanding, and may your words continue to speak life to us. Panginoon, may you continue to allow us to not only grow in the knowledge of your word, but be transformed by it, that we may be more and more like Christ. Panginoon, may you be with us this morning as we study your word. And more so, we thank you, because as we pray, We know that you are a God who ministers. Kayo po ang Panginoon na nagpapala. You're the one who provides for our needs. You're the God who heals the sick. You're the God who comforts those who are grieving. Panginoon, may your grace continue to minister to each and every one of us. Panginoon, sa iyo po lahat ng kapurihan at pasasalamat sa lahat ng bagay. We honor you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
Good morning, our dearest brothers and sisters from Community Bible Church of Marikina. At gano'n na din po sa ating mga kapatid mula sa DJCC Tumana. Indeed, it's a joy once more to worship God together, worship Him through songs of praise, and more so worship and honor Him through the study of God's Word. I'm Pastor Jair Navarro, and once more, it's my joy and privilege to lead you in the study of God's Word. Today, we continue our study on Job's second monologue. Last week, we have tackled Job chapter 29. And in the previous chapter of Job, we talked about Job's life before the incident. Today, we're going to dig a little bit deeper because today we dig through Job's life after the incident. Job's situation in that present time where all the suffering has befallen him. From longings of a treasured past, what we can see is Job jumps in chapter 32, laments of the present. If we have talked about longings for restoration and longings for Job's former glory in Job chapter 29, the day we are to talk at Job chapter 30, we are to talk about Job's present suffering, his complaints, his laments, contrasting with chapter 29, where Job describes his life prior to what has befallen him, a life of honor and respect, a life marked by blessing of God's abundant health, a life of healthy and hope-filled future, and even a life of effective ministry. In chapter 30, we find these joys turning into complaints. Job was once respected. But now at this moment, or in this chapter, Job is despised and very much mocked. In the words of Dr. Christopher Ash, when he speaks of chapter 30, one of the most painful facets of the judgment of God is that it dehumanizes people. Men and women are created in the infinite dignity and honor, in the image and likeness of God. But through the judgment of God, the judgment of God strips them of this dignity and reduces them to creatures with the status of beasts. So ito po yung kinalalagyan ngayon ni Job. From someone who was very much respected, from someone who was very much sought after by the people around him, from a leader, a regional leader of his people, he became someone who is very much despised and mocked. It is this that Job laments at the head of the second part of his closing speech. In chapter 29, he began with supreme joy of the fellowship with God and went on to describe the consequent dignity of being under this presence of God and being under this communion with God. Here in chapter 30, he begins with the experience of indignity before reflecting on the perceived hostility of God. The structure of chapter 30 therefore reflects a balance between the structure of chapter 29. In 29, it described life under the smile of God, but more so in chapter 30, it throbs with the drumbeat of the terrible, terrible wrath of God. It is coming from an empathic uh, point of a treasured past towards now a present tense wherein uh, Job feels trapped. The words but now and and now was mentioned very much by Job as a refrain from verses 1, verse 9, and all the way to verse 16 of Job chapter 30. And it is saying as though, or it is as though Job is saying, I long for the paradise of the past. But all I can experience now is this hellish present, this hell that I'm in, and there seems like there are, it seems like there's no going out of this situation. The hope that comes from the memory of the past and the hope of his future is removed and replaced by a prison of laments. Before we get to all that, before we continue with this laments of a man of sorrows in Job chapter 30, 
may we start in a word of prayer. Tayo po'y manalangin. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. I thank you, Lord, for the life of each and everyone that's listening to this sermon. Lord, we thank you because we know that your word is true and your word is sure. And more so, we know that as we study your word, you allow the Holy Spirit to, or you cause the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, turn our hearts and our ears towards understanding. So Lord, I pray as we go about this sermon, may you lead us by your grace and whatever causes us to gravitate closer to you, whatever will cause us to joy in the truth of your word, whatever causes us to put our faith in you and respond in humble obedience. Lord, may you allow us the grace to grasp and grab on and cling on to those things. Father, as we talk about your word, we ask that you be glorified. And Lord, we ask that you also hide your servant behind your cross as he preaches today. And may only your words of truth be preached in this pulpit this morning. Father, we just want to honor you and glorify you through the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, like I said, we are to talk about this uh, chapter of laments. In the prior sermons, I once quoted on Job that as great the man Job is and was, his adversity is even greater. In fact, Dr. Warren Rearsby outlines Job's laments in chapter 30, an outline that clearly contrasts Job's longings and joy in chapter 29. Dr. Rearsby divides it into a five-part lament of complaints, which I do believe would be a befitting study and reflection for us as we delve into this chapter. So in start of our study today, I'm here to talk to you and share to you guys about these complaints of Job, these five-point laments of Job as outlined by Dr. Warren Rearsby. Firstly, let me talk about Job's first complaint. He said, Job complains, I have no respect. You can find that in verses 1, and it echoes down all the way to verse 15. The people who once admired and respected Job have turned against him. These people who admired and respected Job now despise him. They reject him and even mock him. As most commentators put it, this section can actually be divided into two parts. As we talk about Job or his respect being taken away, it could be divided into two parts. Firstly, it speaks about a portrait of Job's mockers. Ano ba itong mga katangian ng mga taong nagmamak kay Job? And more so, we get to also talk about on the second half of it, the mockery that Job had to endure. So first, let's get on with the portrait of Job's mockers. Let me read to you guys verse 1 all the way to verse 8. Job says, But now they laugh at me. Men who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. What could I gain from the strength of their hands? Men whose vigor is gone. True want and hard hunger, they gnaw the dry land by night in waste and desolation. They pick salt wort and the leaves of the bushes and the roots of the broom tree for their food. They have driven out or driven out of from or they are driven out from human company. They shout after them as a thief. In galleys of the torrents they must dwell. In holes of the earth and the rocks among the bushes they bray. Under the nettles they hurdle or huddle together. A senseless, nameless brood, they have been whipped out of the land. It's kind of poetic in a lot of ancient description. He speaks in a lot or with a lot of figures of speech as he describes his mockers. But what we can see through verses 1 to 8 is the headline fact about the mockers of Job. Firstly, the mockers of Job are younger than Job. You can see that in the very first verse of chapter 30. 
there is actually a proper order in human society. I think everyone is familiar with this, in which wise elders ought to be respected by those who are younger than they are. In chapter 29, I hope you can remember what we talked about before. In chapter 29, we remember that Job mentions that the young man saw him and withdrew in humble respect. That is how Job was very much sought after and respected in his previous glory or in his life prior to what has befallen him. Young men will withdraw. Princes will even put a hushing finger in their mouths out of respect to Job. Here, the order is seemingly turned upside down. They mock Job mercilessly. What makes it even worse is this. What makes it worse is the people or are the people who mock and despise Job. He likens or Job likens their fathers to donkeys wandering in the wilderness. Men who are not even fitted to be at the command of Job's sheepdogs. That is a very strong statement coming from Job. The fathers of those who are younger, those who mock and despise him, those who make fun of him, are not even worthy to be put in charge of Job's sheepdogs. They are fools, according to Job. Children of base men. This uh, expresses them of being the lowest and the most sordid kind. Think about a group of people here, my dear uh, brothers and sisters. People who are the lowest of the low in their culture and society. Who simply forage for food and for firewood. These are like scavengers. Scavengers who had nothing or had nothing to eat or nothing to live with, not even clothed. They simply forage. They simply forage for their food and their shelter. Job was very much tortured by this irony. They are a gaunt from want, or they are gaunt from want and hunger. They had to live in clefts of the valley. They are sons of fools. Job thought of what worthless men, men without vigor, were now his loud critics. Imagine niyo po ito. From being a man that is very much respected, from being a man who is sought after by the nobles, respected by the leaders of his society, to someone who is despised by the lowest of the low. Yung mga nasa laylayan ng lipunan. Sila yung tumutuya kay Job. These were sons of fools, worthless men, men without vigor. They have in turn became the critics of Job. Job struggles with this. Job complains and laments about this because it was so unjust. The words of Job here stresses his humiliation. He feels like now because he is being taunted by the lowest of the low, he in turn was the lowest of the low. He was like the outcast of outcasts. Having described his mockers, we have shown you a picture of what these mockers are in their character. Job continues with the refrain, and now, and jumps into a description of the substance and significance of their mockery. Now, Job brings us to the second part of this lament and complaint. Job says, I have no respect. I am being mocked by the lowest of the low. Now, he brings us the picture of how these men are mocking him. Let me read to you, my dear brothers and sisters, what's written in verses 9 all the way to 15. Job writes, And now I have become their song. I am a byword to them. They abhor me. They kept aloof from me. They do not hesitate to speak at the sight of me. Because God has loosed my cord and humbled me. They have cast off, uh, or they have cast off restraint in my presence. On my right hand, the rabble rise. They push away my feet. They cast upon against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They need no one to help them. As though a wide breach they come, amid the crash they roll on, terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind, and my prosperity 
has passed away like a cloud. Here Job describes this mockery that he has to endure at the hands of these debased men. Imagine how Job is being mocked, how he is being made fun of by the lowest of the low. Verse 9 headlines and echoes what is written in verse 1 of chapter 30, saying, they laugh at me. Job had become one of their jokes. Isa na siyang kasabihan ng panunuya. A laughing stock among the lowest of the low. Job has become their song. In a sense, a taunting song. To become Job now is like an idiom, a byword. An idiom that refers to someone being utterly cursed and worthless. Para po bang naging kasabihan na siya, gusto mo bang maging katulad ni Job? And when they say, maging katulad ni Job, they mean the lowest of the low. Someone who is very much cursed by God. Someone who is very much worthless. Someone who is at the lowest of the low. In verses 10 to 14, the substance and the significance of their mockery alternate. Firstly, let me talk about verse 10. The substance is that they regard Job as utterly despicable. These men who are very much despised and rejected by their society, in turn, despise and reject Job. Imagine the irony. Those who are despised, those who are at the lowest of the low, putting Job even lower. There may be a camaraderie, according to some philosophical points, or in philosophical points, there may be some camaraderie among outcasts. It's like those who are at the lowest of the low, they cling together. They have their antisocial social club, per se. But this is not extended to Job. Para po bang pagdating kay Job, mas mababa pa siya. So he is not welcome. They keep their distance from him. And according to Job, he, they even spit when they see him. According to other translations, it is even more likely that Job is saying here, they spit in his face every time that they see him. The mockery, the unjustness of this debased man. Verse 11 uncovers the significance of their mockery. It happens, Job knows that it happens because God has loosed his cord and had brought him low. The idiom here, the thought of losing one's cord may refer, uh, by, according to Bible scholars, it may refer to the human life as a fragile tent. That's the first description of the term losing one's cord. A fragile tent or the human life compared to a fragile tent. So that when the tent cord is loose, the tent collapses. It can also be likened into the human strength as being like a bow. So that when the bow is unstrung, the human strength becomes weak. Two descriptions of this idiomatic expression, this figure of speech about losing one's cord. Either way, Job knows here that God was the one who has done this. It is as though that God has unleashed the dogs of war so that the proper order of human society is removed by God's restraint. It is taken away, that restraint of God. As a result, in verses 12 to 14, the mockers became Job's attackers. In a vivid imagery of a siege, this rabble rises against him. This debased man went up to trip him. It is as though they build a siege ramp against him, meaning uh, they have casted their rays of destruction against Job. Verses 13 and 14 uses this wild metaphors to portray their crashing on Job's life to destroy him. Now, Job was not just made low. It is as though they were attacking him further. He was already made low and they want to put him even lower, even to the point perhaps of destroying him ultimately. Continuing in verse 15, Job points back to the significance of all this with the evocative words, terrors. This word speaks of the terrors of death. And later we're going to go on with this. It also has supernatural 
connotations. May we remember Bildad when he speaks this. Bildad says of the wicked man, Terrors frighten him on every side and chase him at his heels. He is torn from the tent in which he trusted and is brought to the king of terrors. Remember the picture of hell portrayed by Bildad. Job here kind of remembers this by using the word terrors. In fact, it wasn't just Bildad who spoke about terrors, but rather Job also himself speaks of this as he said, terrors overtake the wicked man. Job chapter 27, verse 20. The indignities, my dear ones, these indignities suffered by Job speaks to us of a creation order that is very much disordered. It speaks to us, therefore, of death breaking into the world. The effect of this mockery that Job is experiencing is not just to hurt Job's feelings. It's not something that is attacking Job in an emotional state. But they are like terrors to take away something even greater. Terrors to take away Job's honor, to take away Job's reputation, and more so, take away Job's name as God's servant. Job cries out here, my brothers and sisters. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my honor as the wind, and my prosperity passed or has passed like a cloud. Job here mourns the agony of his present state of being despised among men. When before he was very much respected and honored, his honor and prosperity had vanished. Job feels terrified now. He doesn't feel safe nor secure. The mockers have treated Job in such a way, has treated Job so badly that he has lost all sense of dignity and honor. Job here, my brothers and sisters, is blown away. Like a strong wind, all seems lost for Job. He is completely blown away. Moreover, Job speaks. He continues his laments from complaining that I have no respect to complaining now, secondly, by saying, I have no blessing. Let me read for you, my dear brothers and sisters, what's written in Job chapter 30, verse 16 to 23. It says here, And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With great force my garments is disfigured. It binds me about like a collar or like the collar of my tunic. God has cast me into the mire and I have become like the dust and the ashes. I cry to you for help and you do not answer me. I stand and you only look. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind or upon the wind. You make me ride on it and you toss me about in the roar of the storm. For I know that you will bring death to me and to the house appointed for all living. We could very well entitle this part of Job's laments as Job complains, I am cursed. As he writes not only of his lack of blessing, but rather he writes about his dire condition. The first two verses in this section Verses 16 to 17 describes Job's mental, emotional, and physical condition. His soul is poured out like water. He is mentally and emotionally drained of strength. His condition is weak because of his affliction. His condition could very much be likened to that kind of pain when someone suffers pain where no drug will be able or is able to take away the pain. Pain that is so great that it keeps you from sleeping. Sa sobrang sakit po ng dinadanas ni Job, tila ba hindi na siya makatulog? And as Job lies awake in night, feeling all this pain in his body, feeling all his pain in his emotions, he is wrecked all the more by the pain of hearing the voices of his tormentors. The insults simply keep coming or keep running through his mind. Just picture out this 
very destitute state of Job, from a life that once flourished to a life now of pain, a life of misery, a life of mockery. Job describes the terrible effects of his suffering, his physical condition, and he likens it to being choked by a powerful force, a force binding his neck. He speaks of this in verse 18 to 19, an overall picture likened to being grabbed by the neck and thrown into the mire, or even worse, thrown into a raw open sewer. Para po bang uh, sinakal na siya, ibinato pa siya sa may basurahan. And Job blames God in this situation. He blames God for throwing him in the trash heap. In continuation, my brothers and sisters, in verses 20 to, 30, uh, 20 to 23, in the verses right at the heart of chapters 29 to 31, we find Job now addressing God. Addressing God for once and the only time in chapters 29 to 31. Trapped in this seemingly eternal now. Trapped now in this hellish present of misery. Job cries out to God for help. After being choked and thrown into the mire, Job comes before God and cries for help. But the sad truth here, my brothers and sisters, we find in verse 20 that God gives no answer. Job stands in the posture of urgent and earnest petition, but God just looks at him with silent inaction. It is as though Job is a man who prays like he has never prayed before. Talaga pong nanalangin. He prayed, he pleaded before God, but his prayers were met with silence from heaven. Thus, he concludes, he experienced God as cruel, as one with a persecuting hand. He sees God as one who lifts him up, exalting him to be a great person, Yet in turn, God has only done that like a tornado lifts up a man or lifts up an object and he will try to swirl it all up and up and up and then all of a sudden, he will simply crash him and dash him back to the ground. Job feels the same way as though God has lifted him up to be great only to put him up in the sky then afterwards, dash him back to the ground to destroy him. That is what has happened to Job. So Job concludes that what God has in mind in this chapter is simply bringing him right down to death. The silence, my brothers and sisters, the silence of heaven in response to Job's prayer for him must mean that God simply intends to kill him. Job feels forsaken, forsaken by everyone he knows. But more so, Job feels like he is forsaken and mistreated by God. Job's agony, we find in this section, is very much expressed in vivid imagery. Job feels like God has grabbed him by the neck and God has thrown him into the mud. Job cries out in prayer and he hears no answer. He stands before God as a beloved follower of God, but God simply ignores him. Job feels like God is cruel, using his great power to oppress and attack him, beyond to that extent of how anyone should have suffered. Para po bang lubus-lubusan naman yung binibigay sa kanya na attack and suffering ng Diyos. He feels like God has tossed him into a violent storm in order to destroy him, and that God is simply sending here Job to his deathbed the fate of all those who live. What a destitute, destitute situation. Job cries out and complains, I have no blessing. It feels like I'm cursed, God. Job continues. And Job cries out all the more. The third complaint of Job, my brothers and sisters, is this. Job complains, I have no help. Verses 24 to 25. Let me read for you, my dear brothers and sisters. Yet does not one in the heap of ruin stretch out his hand and in his disaster cry for help? 
Did I not weep for him whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the needy? Job here speaks about something that hurts him so much. The fact and reality that it is as though there is no help for him. Surely, he would not stretch out his hand against the heap of ruin. Job felt as though, God, you're actually more merciful than this, God. I know you, God. Please, you got to be more merciful than this. You are something more than what you are doing to me. You would not afflict a pitiful heap of ruins if only it would cry out to you. And Job is like crying out to God, Lord, I'm crying out to you. You are more merciful than this. Job here, my dear brothers and sisters, wondered why God does not respond to his cries. Clearly, we find Job heartbroken. He is stunned and disappointed that there was no one willing to help him in this horrible circumstance. What wicked person, scholars ask, what wicked person would kick a man when he is down and out? How cruel do you have to be to go after the broken person. Nonetheless, this is how his mockers treated him. He was already down and out. Job is asking for help, but no one comes, not even God. To take matters even worse and to make it even harsher or make Job feel a little bit more desperate and depressed, Job knows what it is like to have compassion for the needy. As you remember, Job chapter 29, it speaks about Job's ministry to the fatherless, Job's ministry to the widow, to those who are blind. Job was like an, a set of eyes to them. To those who are lame, Job walks for them. To the stranger that Job doesn't even know, Job fights for their justice. But to make matters worse, even though Job knows what it is to have compassion for the needy and a deep compassion for the poor, troubled, and helpless, now Job is down and out. No one would help him. Why doesn't God, or at least anyone, sympathize with him? Job cries out, I have no help. The irony of it all, I was helping everyone else. In my previous glory, when I was respected and sought after, I was trying my best to help everyone else. But now when I'm down and out, no one seems to care. Continuing, Job complains, I have no future. After seeing no response from anyone, after seeing that no one cares, Job complains, perhaps I just have no future anymore. Let me read verses 26 to 28. But when I hoped for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil and are never still. The days of my affliction comes to meet me. I go about darkened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and I cry for help. Job feels disheartened, my brothers and sisters, disheartened and dismayed. Job's future look dim and grim. It is not good, nor is it encouraging. When he hoped for light, all he received was darkness. And by darkness, according to scholars, it means that Job didn't receive no answers for, uh, from God. No answers to why he is suffering. Some scholars will even say, or maybe he was saying that he longed for relief. But nonetheless, he got none. He looked for the light, but he was only met by darkness. He looked for good, but evil came. The main and continuing point that we can find here, my brothers and sisters, from verses 24 to 26, is that it is as though God has not treated Job as Job have treated others. When Job was a regional ruler, he came across sufferers. He wept for them. His soul was grieved and he took pity on them. That is seemingly what is right. Seemingly what the godly is supposed to do. And it is simply also the response that Job actually expects from God. Perhaps Job is 
asking or thinking, as I have dealt with the needy, as I have dealt with the poor, the widowed, the fatherless, maybe God will also deal with me with kindness. But Job doesn't receive this. He didn't receive what he expected of God. When Job was needy, when Job's day was hard, God didn't seem to weep for him or take pity on him. On the contrary, God didn't just not weep for him, but rather God sent him yet even more evil. It is as though God has sent him even deeper darkness amidst his dark destitute situation. It seems as though there is no hand to help him whatsoever. Job, the deserter or the deserted, he feels as though there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Job cries out, there is no future for me. There is no hope whatsoever. It seems as when they say it when, when you experience darkness, there is always going to be light at the end. But Job by no means can see it. There's no response from God. There is no help from anyone else. In ending, as Job ends this five-point imagery of laments, Job lastly complains, I have no ministry. In other words, let me say, Job complains, no one ministers to me. Let me read what's written in the final verses from verses 29 all the way to 31. Job reads and says and cries out, I am a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin turns black and falls from me and my bones burn from heat. My lyre is turned to mourning. My pipe to the voice of those who weep. Job here, in ending, is abandoned. He is alone and desolate. And more so, even worse, Job is treated like a wild animal, reflecting what Dr. Christopher Ash speaks about God's judgment, dehumanizing man, taking away all dignity and respect, treating man with the status of beast. All dignity and respect were stripped away. No one will reach for him. No one will minister to his need. Job continues to describe the depth or the depth and the endurance of his misery. He is all churned up inside with day after day affliction as it was coming to meet him. Each morning he wakes to another day of difficulty. There was like no rest for him. It's like every day that goes by, it simply gets worse and worse. And even worse, his physical ailment has left him outwardly decaying. He says here that he is so churned up, he is black, and is, it is as though as his skin falls from him. And more so inwardly, he was not just decaying outwardly. Inwardly, he is very much fevered. He is darkened by grief. And in the last verse, it gives us a very powerful imagery of what Job is feeling. The harp, culturally, was an instrument of joy and comfort. We know that whenever Saul was being tormented by a demonic spirit, David will play the harp to calm him down. It was an instrument of joy and comfort. The flute, on the other hand, is an instrument of joy and celebration. A flute is an instrument of jubilee. But Job's harp and pipe is now stricken by grief. All that Job hears now is wailing. His whole life consumed by mourning and weeping. Job was once respected. He was respected for who he was and what he did. Now Job's life consists of being daily despised, an ending pain, physically and emotionally, even mentally perhaps. And more so, he faced a daily of having his prayers unanswered. It is as though that Job was despised by every man and seemingly ostracized by God himself. 
Job is put in a desperate, destitute, depressed state. Continuing, we talk about now this laments of a man with many sorrows. We sum it all up. What is the relevance of this all? In ending to the second part of Job's monologue, he complains, he cries out, and he laments. We hear here the laments of a suffering man. For the third time in this sermon series, I would like to quote on Dr. David Mackina as he comments on Job's anguish. It is though like a wounded lover, Job asks the question, who has changed? Is it I who changed? Or was it you, God? Job, on what has befallen him, cries out to God, the God who was with him in all aspects and respects of his former glory, and the same God whose hand is now seemingly against him. He complains, and even for the record, he has even said things that are very much inappropriately ascribed to God, things that are very much dead wrong, Job laments and grieves and sorrows over his depressed, destitute, godless state. But amidst this situation, amidst this desperate state, amidst being put to the lowest of the low, in the ruin and in the rubble, Job points to someone who is yet to come. As Job here expresses the laments of a man with many sorrows, he points to a man, a coming man, with even greater sorrow. A man spoken of by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. Let me read for you, my dear brothers and sisters. Isaiah 53 verses 2 to 3. For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that, would, or that you should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Amazingly, my brothers and sisters, Job continues to foreshadow Christ. Last week, we talked about Job's longings and how it foreshadows a coming Christ who will be the perfect king that Israel was looking for. And more so, it also symbolizes our longings for God's return or for Christ's return to rule with justice and mercy to set everything right. Job even in his present desolation, foreshadows Christ. Amidst that, Job pictures what the Isaiah or prophet Isaiah was writing about in Isaiah chapter 53. He speaks and he portrays of the coming Christ, the Son of God who is to be made flesh, the Son of God for whom redemptive suffering will turn God's good order upside down. From a Christ exalted over all creation to a Christ despised by sinners. In verses 1 to 15, specifically verse 11, Job rightly understands that the order or the disorder he experiences is God's doing and that it has supernatural dimensions. I have told you all back that we'll get back to the supernatural connotations of what Job is suffering. The unleashing of death into the world that he had known as the world of life and order. Job was experiencing the judgment of God. He cannot understand why this is so, but on our side of the cross of Christ, Job's indignity begins to make sense as it foreshadows the redemptive suffering of the cross, when one greater than Job will in turn suffer even greater indignities than Job's. Christ, he was the Son of God. 
He was eternal. He was there from the very beginning for whom all things was created. Christ from whom and for whom all things are made was made flesh and he dwelt among us. Jesus who ministered, Jesus who came to heal, feed, and serve us, who taught and proclaimed God's kingdom is at hand and is to come. The God-man who lived a sinless, perfect life was born, okay? He was born to suffer indignities at the hands of rebellious creation. We're the same people that he healed, fed, and served, whom cheered for him during his triumphant entry to Jerusalem. These same people will later cry out with the foolish Pharisees saying, crucify him, crucify him. A man who will be deserted by his very disciples. He will be deserted by the men who had walked with him, who lived with him, who seen every deed of him all throughout the three years of his ministry. This very man will desert him as he is to be hung upon the tree. A man who will be wearing the crown that showed no dignity. And the king of kings who's going to be placed for all the world to see to show this grace. The hands that mended creation to be pierced for transgression. And the one who was from all eternity to die in this grace, to die on that cross. What we can see, my brothers and sisters, is redemption or redemptive suffering will turn the order upside down. As it was turned upside down for Job, more so, it was turned upside down for Christ. Moreover, as redemptive suffering turns God's order upside down, the remainder of Job's lament takes us deep into the heart and pain of his sufferings. For it is a suffering that is so necessary that God will not heed the calls of the sufferer until it is accomplished. The second point as we end, second point I'd like to point to you, aside from the redemptive suffering will turn the order upside down. The second point I'd like you to take here is redemptive suffering is absolutely necessary. So necessary that there must be no answer from God. Picture this out and what Job portrays as his prayers were unanswered by God. That the Son of God himself will be denied as he pleaded, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Matthew chapter 26 verse 39. That the Son of God will be crying out, like I said last week, the Son of God crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There will be no answer to the cries of the Son of God. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. As he hung upon that cross, as Christ hung upon that wooden cross made by sinners, beaten and put to death by sinners, as the father, or as the father veered away. Job's sufferings foreshadow the pain of a man who had to go right down to death, even death on the cross, before his cries would be answered by God. There is a terrible divine necessity about redemptive suffering. God is doing something so ultimately wonderful here that unanswered prayer is the necessary price of achieving it. And Job begins to experience this, my brothers and sisters. His prayers will not be answered, or it will only be answered, but only when his sufferings have achieved what God has purposed them. In a deeper way, it was the same for Christ. God will keep a silent ear. He will not respond until what he has planned through suffering is accomplished. 
The same it is with Jesus. He was not heard. His cries for, let this cup pass from me. His cries, Father, why have you forsaken me? Was not answered by God. Only answered when he had endured the suffering. More so, redemptive suffering is so necessary that it needs to be endured. Continuing what the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 53. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep had gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. There is a divine necessity about the sufferings of Job. There is something that is deeply necessary that it justifies the injustice and the unanswered prayer of this righteous man. For centuries later, it will justify the actions or the most unjust actions in human history. It will justify the most wretched actions of men when a man without sin will be falsely accused, unfairly condemned, unjustly stripped away of all dignity and respect, excluded from society, and submitted to an utterly disgraceful death at the hands of sinners. Justifying a righteous man's loud cries and tears, going unanswered until the task is finished. Jesus is the picture here, my dear brothers and sisters. Let me read how it was portrayed. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Nonetheless, let me explain something here. Jesus asked that the cup be taken away from him in Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Yet that cup was not taken away from him. Nevertheless, his prayer was heard because his prayer was not actually to escape what the Father's will is, but to actually accept it. And that prayer was definitely heard. Although Christ was the Son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 to 9. I just can't imagine this great unconditional love of God that his very own, that his very son would be traded for sinners just like you and me that the Son of God will be brought low, that the Son of God will be put to utter disgrace and indignities, that the Son of God will suffer shame and the most excruciating pain of being nailed to the cross for sinners, for wretched sinners like you and me. In ending, how does this make sense for us? What do we make of Job's second part or the second part of job's final speech well brothers and sisters i have to answer ultimately the cross the necessity of redemptive suffering turning all order and even what man knows of god upside down the necessity of a just man suffering the necessity of the cross and as this was ultimately necessary for Christ and even necessary for Job, it too is necessary for us Christians of today. It remains necessary that we followers of Christ should know what it is to experience suffering and pain and even at times prayers being unanswered in the presence of this injustice and ungodliness that we face in this age. 
it is ultimately necessary. As it was for Christ, as it was for Job, so it is necessary for us to endure suffering, to stand firm upon His word amidst persecution and mockery, to stand upon our hope amidst the difficulties of this dying world. Ultimately, Job is to find out. And as we know in Christ, we too will see God's purpose and great purpose achieved by suffering. Why are we going through all these things that we're going through now? Why does God not help us during the times that we pray and we're so desperate? Why would Job not hear, or why would God not hear Job? Because God is working amidst the suffering. And in turn, when everything is said and done, we will see the greater purpose and the greatest joy of what God has achieved. As we now know what He has done for us through Christ on the cross, we will know the purpose of suffering. But not now. Hindi pa po ngayon. Not yet. As we tarry, may we cling to our hope in God. May we cling to what we know of God. May we cling to the Christ who saves, to the Christ who is our Redeemer, to the Christ who is to be Job's Redeemer in the following chapters. That being said, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the study of your word. Father, we thank you for your word is true and your word is sure. And more so, as you surely picked up from the suffering that Job has experienced, and more so, you have delivered from the suffering that was in, uh, felt by Christ himself. Lord, surely, you will allow us soon to know the purpose of our suffering. Nonetheless, Lord, may you allow us to cling to our hope, cling to our Christ who took that weight for us. May you allow us to dwell in what he has done for us as he propitiated for us that he suffered indignities on our behalf so that now we can have this life, this relationship with you, and more so this purpose that you are doing in us. Father, may you allow us to cling to our hope until the suffering makes way for life's final victory. Until we know and learn about all the purposes and feel its joy, may you allow us to cling ever to our God. Father, we just honor you and we glorify you. To you be the honor and the praise in all this. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, Paul.